Tonight, the backlash aimed at the man at the center of a political firestorm and his family. I'm sure uh, afraid to show their faces. A family friend tells CBC News why Yaroslav Hunko was in Parliament, the shock and regret. And we break down whether the rules should change with a former House Speaker. New York underwater. Heavy rain inundates the city in just minutes. A life-threatening rainfall event. And it's not over yet. Police say they've finally solved the mystery of who killed rapper Tupac Shakur. This is the indictment we've been waiting almost three decades for. The memoir that reignited the investigation. This is The National with Ian Henemanzi. One week after members of parliament honored Yaroslav Hunka, who fought for the Nazis, we're hearing for the first time from someone close to his family. She's opening up to CBC News about how this could have happened and the shock rippling through their hometown. North Bay, Ontario is in the riding of the now former Speaker of the House, Anthony Rota. Rota says he recognized Hunka last week without knowing his Nazi past. And in North Bay, he wasn't alone. Ashley Burke spoke to a friend of Hunka's who's been in touch with the family this past week. The friend says she knows the former soldier only as a proud Ukrainian, now in hiding from a furious backlash. That was a shock to me. Barb Bonifant says her longtime friends, the Hunkas, are now in hiding in North Bay. I'm sure uh, afraid to show their faces. And... Bonifant says she's known the family for more than 30 years. The Hunka family is known for their integrity. She says all she knew about Yaroslav Hunka is that he's Ukrainian. <laughs> Last Friday, during the Ukrainian president's visit, their local MP, Speaker of the House, Anthony Roda, paying tribute to his guest, 98-year-old Hunka. It later came to light, Hunka fought in a Nazi military unit. Days later, Rhoda resigned and the Prime Minister apologized. The family isn't talking publicly, but Bonifant received a message from Hunka's daughter-in-law after the appearance. She said that her family was shocked of what happened and if her and her husband would have had any idea what was going to happen, they would have never ever brought this 98-year-old man to, to Ottawa. Bonifant says the family didn't know about Rhoda's plan to honour Hunka in Parliament and says she's sad about how everything's played out. They just thought he would be in the same room as the president. How does a mistake you know? like that happen? How does it happen? Both Hunka and Rhoda separately dined at Hannah and Ivan Schrute's restaurant. Like many in the community, they're upset the Prime Minister hasn't also shouldered the blame. If your uh, soldiers uh, make a mistake, the, the, uh, uh, the general is responsible. And this is the case that, you know, that he should be the one that, uh, you know, that is uh, maybe step away as well. Larry Fold says Rhoda called him personally to apologize. Fold lost family in the Holocaust. I know who he is as a person and uh, I, I know he has certainly no forethought of malice. Fold said an investigation needs to happen into Hunka's past for everyone's sake. Either he should be exonerated and we should know that he came here properly and that there, there's nothing in, you know, in, in the background, or we should find out that there is and you know, the proper authorities will deal with it. Right now, the only one who knows some of the answers that people are seeking is Yaroslav Hunka himself. His family has received CBC's request for an interview, but has not yet responded. Ashley Burke, CBC News, North Bay, Ontario. Later on The Breakdown, this scandal prompting new questions about Canada's past. It was easier for a Nazi, believe it or not, to come into Canada at the end of World War II than it was for a Jewish refugee. What Canada did and did not do to keep Nazis out of this country after the war, that's in about 25 minutes. Saskatchewan's premier is defending his decision to keep his school pronoun policy alive, even after a judge granted an injunction putting it on hold. Scott Moe says he plans to invoke the Charter's notwithstanding clause, which allows provinces to override constitutional rights and freedoms. And as Bonnie Allen shows us, that is getting reaction. Uh, there are tools available. Uh, uh, 
uh, to the government to ensure that this policy is in place. Premier Scott Moe is doubling down, determined to bypass the court so that children under 16 need parental consent to use different names or pronouns at school. While I'm not surprised, I'm horrified. You know, I am absolutely shocked and aghast at the fact that my government is going to strip my community of rights. The policy has been divisive from the start. A similar one was introduced in New Brunswick. One is now also being considered in Manitoba. Hands up our children! All part of growing tension over gender diversity in schools. On Thursday, a Regina judge said the pronoun policy could cause irreparable harm to children. He pressed pause on it, pending a review of its constitutionality. Mo plans to go around that using the notwithstanding clause. The lawyer who got the injunction says that's telling. The government apparently believes it doesn't stand a chance of defending the case or it just doesn't care what the court will ultimately decide. The government's measures now as controversial as the policy. I will definitely say uh, uh, kids must ask their parents. Uh, it is good if uh, they need permission. A law like this will not make parents better informed. What it will ensure is that the kids stay closeted. This political scientist says after losing three by-elections, Mo is likely trying to appeal to more conservative voters. And there's little political risk. I don't see this as the type of wedge that will split the Sask Party or split caucus or drive a lot of people who, um, who support the government away. What's at stake is children, right? Children that are struggling to sort of be who they want to be. The federal justice minister can't stop Mo, but he's urging the premier to reconsider. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Swift Current, Saskatchewan. New York City is under state of emergency tonight after torrential rain caused widespread flooding. The governor is pleading with people to stay home, but as Chris Reyes shows us, some aren't taking that advice. You can barely see the concrete jungle through the rain. 15 centimeters falling in a matter of hours all over New York City, turning streets into rivers, storm drains into whirlpools, subway stations into waterfalls. Some New Yorkers living up to their reputation and powering through against all advice, including a state of emergency declaration. And I want to say to all New Yorkers, uh, this is time for heightened alertness and extreme caution. But the warnings were not enough. The rain wreaked havoc on every form of transportation, stranding drivers, commuters, travelers, even students because schools stayed open. The mayor defended that decision, but parents were frustrated. There's a big flood downstairs in the basement. There's chaotic in the um, auditorium. It took me an hour and a half. I've been out here an hour and a half trying to get my son. It's pretty bad. It's just flooding in the water and they canceled all the flights. I'm lost. I'm lost. I feel terrible. I don't even know where I'm going because I'm, I'm accustomed to catching a particular train. Now I come, the train is delayed. I don't know when. It's disgusting. For all the inconvenience, a point of pride for officials. No deaths or injuries reported so far. Two years ago, about the same amount of rain from remnants of Hurricane Ida killed 11 people in Queens after being trapped in flooded basements. Still, this rainfall no less concerning because of the trend it represents. More extreme weather for a city increasingly vulnerable to it. This month is now one of the wettest Septembers in New York's history. We lose more lives of people during flooding events, of which we've had many. And it's not over yet. A flood advisory is in effect until Sunday. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Today, the U.S. Secretary of State urged India to cooperate with Canada in the investigation into the murder of a Sikh activist. Uh, those responsible uh, need to be held accountable. And uh, we uh, uh, hope that our uh, friends in both uh, Canada and uh, India will work together to resolve this matter. Blinken delivered the message in a meeting with his Indian counterpart. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau implicated the Indian government in the killing of Hardeep Singh Nijjar in Surrey, British Columbia in June. A CBC News investigation reveals a growing number of people from India are seeking protection here in Canada. As Jorge Barrera explains, some say it's a direct result of actions by India's government. 
Rendir Singh says the torture broke him. He says Indian police held him for three days, beat him with wooden sticks, and kicked out his teeth. He is one of the most traumatized people that I've seen in the last 10 years. His story among a growing number in the Canadian refugee claim system. India is currently the third largest source of accepted refugee claims. A growing trend that began after Narendra Modi took power in 2014. That year, Canada accepted under 20 refugee claims from India. Last year, 3,400. Correlation is not causation, but in this case, uh, you certainly have the causation because you do have uh, repression of minority rights. Raj Sharma is a Calgary immigration lawyer. He says six Muslims and Christians face increased discrimination. Something that we didn't quite see in the past, but we're seeing more now, the increase in terms of religious intolerance. Others say a different story drives the numbers. I think India doesn't really produce any political ref refugees. Uh, they are economic. Shinder Purwal is a political science professor at Kwantlen University in Surrey, B.C. He says fraudulent claims drives the stats. People who are actually refugees, people who actually suffer, uh, they don't get passports, they don't have money to come abroad. It's these smart people who are spending a lot of money to buy all kind of documents. But Singh once lived a good life in India. He managed the Gurdwara in his Punjabi village, his wife, a community leader. That all changed in 2015, when he alleges police accused him of sheltering militants at the Sikh Gurdwara. He says he will be killed if he goes back. Now, alone here, in their new home, they hope the scars will start to heal. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Montreal. Two bombings have killed dozens of people in Pakistan as they gather to celebrate Prophet Muhammad's birthday. A suspected suicide bomber targeted a crowd in southwestern Pakistan that had gathered outside a mosque for a procession. More than 50 people died, about 70 others were injured. The second blast happened at a mosque in the northwest, collapsing the building and killing at least five people. The United Nations now confirms it will send a team into the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh this weekend, its first access to the area in about 30 years. Around 100,000 Armenians have already left in nearly a week since Azerbaijan's military takeover. Briar Stewart is near the border tonight where traumatized, exhausted people are seeking refuge. They just keep coming out of Nagorno-Karabakh. The evacuations happened even more quickly than emergency officials predicted. Among the crowd, those who never knew the home they left and those who spent their entire lives there, all of them traumatized. I was born there. My mother was born there. It's our land, this woman says. I don't know what more to say. Nina Israelian says her cousin died last week in the fighting and that she and her mother lined up yesterday to get on one of the buses. All of these people came from the city of Stepanakert. Some of them are from villages and they left there because they felt it was unsafe. They went to the city and waited for a ride out. About 30% of the refugees are children. Others are in need of urgent medical care. This man was badly burned in last week's explosion of a fuel tank in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's not clear how many residents still remain in the region. But a UN mission is expected to be on the ground there this weekend. There's already a small crew from the Red Cross in Nagorno-Karabakh. So just yesterday we transferred nearly 200 bodies, people who died from either the accident this week or the recent fighting. Officials say there is a huge need for mental health support. At the evacuation center, food and water is handed out by volunteers, including Gabrielle Sabagian a Canadian from Montreal. It's going to be very tough on Armenia to handle uh, accommodating everyone. It's, there's a lot of pressure, not just for the humanitarian side, but politically. Armenia has asked the World Court to order Azerbaijan to withdraw troops from Nagorno-Karabakh. The international community may recognize the disputed region as part of Azerbaijan, but that doesn't change the fact 
The tens of thousands of people are now stranded out of their homes. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Gorries. A partial U.S. government shutdown appears to be imminent. A last-ditch attempt from the Republican House leader failed, voted down by members of his own party. Paul Hunter now on the potential impact. On this vote, the yeas are 198, the nays are 232, the bill is not passed. And so it is that once again the U.S. braces for a partial shutdown of federal government services for the fourth time in 10 years. Said the White House, blame Republicans. This is going to be the extreme part of the House, uh, Republican, it's going to be their shutdown. If there's no last-minute deal on Capitol Hill, and no one thinks there will be, Two million federal workers will stop being paid as of next week. Government services will be severely disrupted, from federal parks and museums to aid programs for farmers, food for the needy, and beyond. We hope it doesn't happen. Our work would clearly be affected uh, by this. It would make it harder to do everything that uh, we do to try to advance national security. Another key concern, the impact on the U.S. economy broadly. A government shutdown is just yet another drag on the economy. I think it's unlikely that a shutdown would directly push us into recession, but it is certainly not helpful. Driving so much of it in fighting within the Republican Party, urged on by former President Donald Trump, with now a tiny faction led by this lawmaker, Florida Representative Matt Gates, pressing for deep spending cuts to countless government programs and insisting to Republican House Leader Kevin McCarthy they won't bend. It's their way or bust. As Senate Democrats see it... Speaker McCarthy is letting a small band of very extreme members override the views of everyone else. Leaving government workers once again caught in the middle. We are urging all of our members to reach out to the congressional members, to call their con congressional members and urge them to keep the government open. So Paul, if this shutdown happens, what can we expect? Well, first off, consider the last time there was a shutdown under Donald Trump in 2018, 2019. It lasted 35 days, so this could go on for a while. but. Here's what it means for federal workers. Those deemed essential, air traffic controllers, TSA agents, Border Patrol agents, etc., they'll still have to show up for work, but they won't be paid. All other workers will stay home, and of course, they won't be paid either. An exception on paychecks, the same lawmakers on Capitol Hill who are creating the shutdown. Their pay will continue in full, no matter what, for as long as it lasts. Paul Hunter in Washington. A man is facing murder charges tonight in a killing that shook the hip-hop world nearly 30 years ago. Dwayne Davis was the shot caller for this group, and he orchestrated the plan. What it means for the enduring mystery, next. Plus, he shouldn't have been honoured in the House of Commons, but what was he doing in Canada at all? I hope this scandal will explode this veil of secrecy. Why some say Canada did too little to keep Nazis out. And later, the kindness of a stranger. How a lost comic book collection brought them together. We're back in two. Hip-hop legend Tupac Shakur's murder has been unsolved for nearly three decades. But today, police arrested 60-year-old Dwayne Davis. Sasha Petrasik now on how investigators say they cracked the case. With memories fading, the murder of rapper Tupac Shakur seemed like the music industry's ultimate cold case until now. This is the indictment we've been waiting almost three decades for. Las Vegas police arrested Dwayne Davis, a 60-year-old former Crips, gang leader. Dwayne Davis was the shot caller for this group of individuals that committed this crime. 25-year-old so Shakur was a rap superstar, as prolific as he was profane. He'd sold more than 75 million records by the time he was shot on the Las Vegas Strip. His black BMW targeted by four men in a white Cadillac, including Davis, who bragged about it in a memoir years later. Police say they confirmed the boasts after a search of Davis's house in July. 
The spark that night, they say, was a beating doled out by Shakur on Davis's nephew, with Shakur seen kicking him on security video at the MGM Grand Hotel. Davis reacted. As they were in the white Cadillac, Mr. Davis took the gun that he had obtained and provided it to the passengers in the rear seat of the vehicle. One of those passengers was Davis's nephew, who has since died. Police can't say who pulled the trigger, but under Nevada law, it doesn't matter. Shakur's death was the latest episode in a violent dispute between rival rapper gangs that defined the U.S. hip-hop scene in the 90s. What he represents in hip-hop was something um, so powerful. You know, he was a complicated figure, um, as, and I think a lot of people resonated with how complicated he was. His fans still transfixed 27 years later. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. On the eve of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, a homecoming nearly a century in the making. It brings a lot of emotions to our nation. The totem pole taken from a community finally returned. Plus, a look inside the vault where the original treaties with First Nations are stored. A lot of people get very emotional as well because these are their ancestors. Why some say it's time to hand over ownership of the documents to First Nations themselves. Plus, an embarrassing moment for Parliament opens questions about a troubling history. Many officials were quite eager, actually, to uh, turn their head away uh, and not to see. Ellen Mora looks at how so many Nazi soldiers settled in Canada. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Tomorrow is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, but across the country, events commemorating and confronting what happened to Canada's residential schools began today. At school, students tied orange ribbons, writing messages recognizing the suffering of generations of children. I think it's terrible that kids were taken away, kidnapped, and killed sometimes. Why would anyone ever want to do that? Why would that even happen? It should not help happen again. Reconciliation is a way of life. The Governor General hosted a discussion with guests, including an elder and residential school survivor. The scars run deep. And the Newfoundland and Labrador Premier apologized to survivors of schools in southern Labrador. We are sorry. History is not forgotten and must not be repeated. You can watch CBC News special coverage of the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation live from Ottawa tomorrow starting at 1 p.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Network, CBC News Explore, GEM and online at cbcnews.ca. In BC's Niska First Nation, reconciliation was tangible today with the return of a stolen totem pole. Lindsay Duncombe was there. This is reunion and reconciliation for the Niska people, a family member finally home. And it brings a lot of emotions to our nation. Emotions that are filled with happiness, filled with grief, filled with tears. But at the same time, we're so very happy to have our ancestor home. The Ptsan, or totem pole, was carved in the 1860s, commissioned by a Niska matriarch in honor of her nephew, Taldit. He was just protecting his own home soil, and he got killed in battle when they were fighting. The nation says it was stolen by a Scottish ethnographer and sold to the Scottish National Museum in 1929. A mission to get it back two decades ago failed. <laughs> The museum says when a new delegation visited last year, things had changed. There has been a really strong shift to really starting to actively engage with the legacy of colonialism in our collections, and that includes working with uh, and listening to the voices of Indigenous people. Getting the poll to British Columbia was delicate, complicated work. The governments of Scotland and Canada foot the bill. First, it had to be dismantled in Scotland, then flown to BC on Canadian military aircraft. 
And I think it's showing other Canadians and it's showing the world uh, what is possible when we work together and we listen to Indigenous peoples and we involve them in making decisions and bringing back the, the return of stolen belongings. The pole will be installed at the Niska Museum, next to one returned from Victoria. There is room for more. As the youngest descendants lay protective cedar, the nation put other governments of France, Germany, Britain, Canada on notice. Niska poles belong here and they're coming for them. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, La Calza. Now it's time to break down the news shaping our world. Tonight, rare access to key pieces of Canada's relationship with Indigenous people, the original treaties. But first... He's a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, and we thank him for all his service. Two men at the center of a national disgrace, a war veteran from a Nazi unit, and the speaker who asked the House of Commons to honor him. I accept full responsibility for my actions. After Anthony wrote his resignation, there are questions about the role of the speaker and whether new rules are needed. Jeff Regan knows a lot about that position. He was House Speaker from 2015 to 2019, just before Anthony Rota. And, and Jeff, from the perspective of a former Speaker, what's your reaction to, to what went wrong here? Well, um, look, I feel very badly for my friend Anthony uh, with the way this worked out, but I think everyone acknowledges this was a very serious error. And we're all, I, mean, I can think of the thousands, well, I don't want to think of the thousands of errors I've made in my life. Uh, but haven't we all? Uh, this was a very serious one, and I certainly understand his decision to with, to resign. Uh, but people are asking really about how do you avoid this, and there's been a lot of talk about whether it, you know, is it a security risk. I don't think that it's a security risk issue here. And so the, the Parliamentary Protective Service uh, would look at the list of people who are coming and assess whether they have a criminal record, whether there are outstanding warrants for them, whether they are a, a security risk which doesn't appear to have been the case here. The question is, what happens in terms of a political risk or an international relations risk? And that's always been where the speaker and the speaker's staff have to watch out for those sorts of things. But, you know, a lot of people are wondering, how, how does a mistake like this be made, even if it is just, uh, you know, not a security matter, but a matter of perception and politics and decency, some would say. Well, you know, a simple Google search might have avoided this problem. So, so how do you think this happened? Uh, I, look, I think those questions have been addressed uh, to uh, Mr. Rhoda, and I think that I have to leave that to him to answer that. Speakers are members of Parliament campaigning in the election for their party. Rhoda is a Liberal MP. You were too. Um, is there anything that happened here that's the responsibility of the Prime Minister? Uh, look... I think that this raises an important issue, and, and that really is uh, that the executive reports to the House of Commons. And why is that important here? Is because the Speaker is, of course, the servant of the House of Commons and also the representative of the House of Commons. And so the Speaker makes the decisions about uh, invitations and, and, and um, basically what happens in the House of Commons. It's not the Prime Minister's job to do that. So I have a real problem with the idea that the Prime Minister's office control things in the House of Commons, right? They have, the, 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 the government side has influence in terms, according to the rules of the House of Commons, but it shouldn't be controlling things and it shouldn't be directing the Speaker because, you know, the reason that we're a democracy in a sense, I mean, the Speaker's central role in the democracy is to make sure that the government reports to the House of Commons, not the other way around. In terms of making sure something like this doesn't happen, Again, do you have any advice for the, the next speaker? I think that members of parliament uh, will be discussing this and are discussing this and will come up with lots of ideas. Any speaker obviously has to be careful with this sort of thing uh, and show good judgment. Uh, but the, the, the House itself may make decisions about how to deal with this going forward. Members of parliament, I think, will undoubtedly have lots of good suggestions for the new speaker. Jeff Regan in Stanhope, Prince Edward Island this evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The incident in Parliament has also raised questions about Canada's past. Thousands with Nazi ties settled here after the Second World War. Ellen Morrow looks at how easy that was and how little has been done about it since. 
That moment brought attention to a really difficult truth. Canada has been home to many, some historians say thousands of people who fought for the Nazis. How did that happen? After the Second World War, Europe was in ruins. So there was a flood of emigration, with tens of thousands coming to Canada. And despite the horrors of the Holocaust, historians say keeping out Nazis and their collaborators wasn't necessarily the top priority for Canadian immigration officials. Anti-communism trumped anti-Semitism. Professor Jan Grabowski says Cold War fears and anti-Semitism helped give some former Nazi troops a way in. In the late 1940s, you have a clear preference for people who have proven record of fighting against the communists. And many officials were quite eager, actually, to uh, turn their head away uh, and not to see the crimes related to their activity. Yaroslav Hunka, the man in Canada's parliament, served in the Waffen-SS Galizia Division, Ukrainian volunteers who joined Hitler's troops to fight Soviet Russia. After surrendering to the British, many of the division's soldiers were eventually transferred to Canada. Others who came to Canada lied or withheld information about their Nazi backgrounds or identities to get in. Helmut Rauka used his middle name when he arrived, becoming a Canadian citizen in the 50s. 30 years later, he was extradited to what was then West Germany, linked to the murders of 10,500 Jewish people. But overall, extraditions have been rare, and prosecution in Canada nearly impossible, experts say, because of a legal decision in 1994. Imre Finta was accused of organizing the deportation of more than 8,000 Jews to Nazi prison camps. Finta was charged under Canada's criminal code, but acquitted. His defense? That he was following the orders of a superior. The Finta case ruined the whole effort to bring Nazis to justice. Efraim Zuroff has spent decades tracking down alleged war criminals around the world. Once Canada accepted it, that's it, goodbye. You can't bring anybody to court and convict them because they'll all say the same thing. The DeShane report says there are people living in Canada who should be prosecuted for Nazi war crimes. In 1985, under pressure, Ottawa set up a public inquiry on how many alleged Nazi war criminals had settled in Canada and what the government should do about it. It's really hard to have a full sense of what the commission found. The whole second half of its report, believed to contain the names of alleged war criminals, has never been made public. Historians and advocates for the Jewish community say that's a problem. If we disregard history, it bites us very strongly on the neck. I hope this scandal will explode this veil of secrecy. The sooner we can look at history straight in the eye, the better for everybody. Let's talk more about this with Bernie Farber, the former CEO of the Canadian Jewish Congress, most of his father's family killed by the Nazis at the Treblinka death camp. Uh, Bernie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me in. Uh, Yaroslav Hunka went in a matter of days from, from being called, and th these are quotes, a war hero uh, to a Nazi monster. What do we know about him and his war record? Well, here's the thing. We, we know very little about Mr. Hunka and his war record. He's 98 years old. Uh, I had believed that the last Nazi standing was Helmut Overlander, who was a translator for uh, an, an SS killing unit in, in eastern Galicia. Um, but we do know that uh, many of his unit, the 14th Division Galicia Waffen SS, made their way into Canada um, and faced no uh, recriminations as, as a result of that. So I wasn't entirely surprised to hear that there were still some left. I was entirely surprised to see him lauded in the gallery of the House of Commons. Uh, Poland has called for Hunka to be extradited. Do you think that should happen? I, I, I think it's a kind of a bit of a sideshow. Uh, we don't have uh, that we know of any evidence specifically against Mr. Hunka. We do know, of course, about his Waffen SS unit, and we do know that the, there's a great possibility that of the 5,000 that were members there, Many may have partaken in uh, in war crimes. After all, the Waffen SS were involved. Today, September 29th, is the 82nd anniversary of the massacre at Babi Yar in, in, in the Ukraine. 33,000 Jews were murdered there. And we know that the Waffen SS played a significant role in that murder. 
So um, it's, it's possible that uh, he or others played some roles, but we just don't have that kind of evidence. And I think it's a sideshow. I think we have to look at the fact that all these people, all these war criminals or alleged war criminals came into Canada. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And why are we still talking about it in 2023 without these answers? I, I would assume that the revulsion towards Nazis and what they did would have been you know, especially strong in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, how did someone who served with the Nazi unit get into Canada? It's quite the opposite, as a, ma as a matter of fact. It was easier for a Nazi, believe it or not, to come into Canada at the end of World War II than it was for a Jewish refugee. And why was that? The Canadian government, the, Brit the Brits, the Americans, they were looking for anti-communists. And my colleague, the late uh, Irving Abella, Professor Irving Abella, history professor at, uh, at York University, former president of Canadian Jewish Congress, he used to say that some of these people would actually show up at immigration and, and, and lift up their left arm and show their SS tattoo, which de denoted that they were, of course, anti-communist, and they actually got into the country. There are stories like that. So th the fact that they got in is not surprising. I think we have to look at the journey that they took to get into Canada. And it's, it's, a, it's a complex and complicated one. They, they surrendered to the British uh, at the end of the war. They ended up in Great Britain. And the British authorities actually convinced Canadians to take a, a large group, up to 2,000, um, of these uh, alleged uh, Waffen-SS people. They weren't alleged. They actually were Waffen-SS people, saying that they had done a check on them and that they seemed to be OK. That's how they got here. They walked in here, as I said, unencumbered. They lived here. They raised families here. They, I don't think they ever gave a second thought uh, to, to the fact that they swore a blood oath to Adolf Hitler, that they served under a Nazi regime, the most murderous regime uh, in, the, in the modern, in modern times. Um, and I don't think we, as Canadians, knew, cared less. Um, and certainly our politicians tried to, I think, for the longest time, right yeah. through till today, sweep it under the carpet. Well, for better or worse, we're learning more about our history now. Bernie, uh, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Ian. Coming up, a rare look inside a historic government vault. They're really only showing a partial story, or we're not really seeing any of the Indigenous perspectives. The First Nations treaties and the calls for greater access to them. That's next. On the eve of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, Canada's future relationship with Indigenous people is on the minds of many. Today, a reminder to remember the past. Inclusive history does not mean that we erase what we know. It means adding to history. Some of that history is in treaties that few Indigenous people have ever seen. Those original documents, some of them two centuries old, remain under strict government custody in the capital region. And recently, CBC News was given rare access. Brett Forrester shares an up-close look. This is where the treaties rest. And so this is the vault. In the bowels of a government preservation center in a secure vault amid rows of priceless artwork and historic treasures, the sacred agreements between First Nations and the Crown lie locked away. So this is where the treaties would be stored? Yes, this is where the treaty is stored. For Manise Young, treaty preservation is a hands-on affair. The Library and Archives Canada official carts this one from the cool climate-controlled vault through the winding concrete of the department's Gatineau, Quebec facility up to a sunny lab on the upper floor. So what we have here is the James Bay Treaty Number 9. It's the um, amendments of the Treaty 9, or adhesions. She traces the fine craftsmanship of this adhesion to Treaty 9 in Ontario, highlighting its ornate gold tooling, black goat leather binding and sturdy parchment pages. With our job in conservation, we're always finding the balance between access, which is what we're doing now, but also the long-term preservation. And Treaty 11... That's the delicate dance now on display. While the public can see these documents on request, few get this close. And while sending them to visit their home First Nations is cumbersome, it does happen, says Young. A lot of people get very emotional as well because these are their ancestors. 
It's a very big connection to the past. That's the case for lawyer and former Kuchiching First Nation chief Sarah Mainville. She got the chance to see the original Treaty 3 while on loan to the First Nations in that territory in western Ontario and Manitoba. It's meaningful to, to see the document. And something communities shouldn't have to wait another century and a half to see again, she adds. The Anishinaabe, um, you know, should have more regular visits uh, with, with these documents, you know, and shouldn't take 150th anniversary. It's easy to feel the power in that presence. Early treaties looked like this. The Huron Tract Purchase of 1827. It opened up a swath of southern Ontario to European settlement, yet it looks like it was scrawled hastily across this single piece of now faded parchment. Compare that with these copies of Treaty 11 or the Williams Treaties, both signed roughly a century later. The careful crafting signals the evolution of treaty making in a new country, but it can't conceal the colonial intent. They're really only showing a partial story. Um, we're not really seeing any of the Indigenous perspectives of that documented record. The prevailing attitude at the time was that Indigenous people were going to disappear and assimilate into mainstream culture. So what does reconciliation look like in here, the Canadian government's official memory? That's a key question for a department that hasn't escaped criticism amid calls for all sectors of society to contribute. It's more than a little ironic for Claudette Commanda to learn where the treaties live. In these steel drawers. Yeah. Her people, the Algonquin Nation, never signed a treaty, meaning the land that both Gatineau and Ottawa occupy was never surrendered by First Nations. Just one of many hard truths she says the country isn't ready to hear. There are many deniers out there that feel that the treaties mean nothing, that the land was meant to be taken. So are they ready? Is Canada ready for the truth? No. And while reconciliation may be messy, she says this solution is simple. The government should be working with First Nations, with Treaty Nations, to ensure that the First Nations, they have the ownership, the control and the management of the treaties that belong to them. Is that what reconciliation would look like in this case? Absolutely. Absolutely. A conversation for another day, perhaps. But for now, it's back to the vault. So, Brett, how has the government responded to that suggestion that we just heard that First Nations should have a greater say in how their own treaties are managed? Well, there would very likely have to be some direction from the minister in charge of Library and Archives Canada for First Nations to get actual control and ownership of their own treaties, not just occasional access. We contacted the office of newly sworn in Heritage Minister Pascal St. Ange for a reaction. They had no comment, Ian, and just redirected the question back to the archives. All right, Brett, thank you. Coming up, a complete stranger whose donation made him a comic book hero. Like, I, I had all of this. The okay. alien agenda, yeah, yeah, I yeah. had all of it. Okay. The emotion from one comic book collector to another. Next, in our moment. These two, Barney Tama on the left and Gord McRae on the right, were complete strangers until last month when Gord saw Barney on CBC News. Barney had just lost his home and his collection of 34,000 comic books to a wildfire in BC's interior. What Gord did next is our moment. Totally. Hey, man. My pleasure, my pleasure. Really. Oh, man, honestly. Well, I was watching Situation on Fires on CBC News, and I saw Barney interviewed, and he was just describing how he'd lost his whole house. I lost everything. 34,000 comics gone. That was my retirement fund. And I just thought, well, I've got a collection, a few boxes, and uh, it made sense to me to, wow. to do something kind. Well, these are what we call square bound. Oh yeah, okay. So the, like I, I had all of this, the okay. alien agenda. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. had all of it. Okay. I just, when you see them that you lost and then they're right here, now, <laughs> yeah, oh right. my God, really? It's totally awesome. To, to, get, to get some back, can't thank you enough, it's beyond words. The generosity and the joy really is beyond words. Our, our producer, by the way, says his uncle had some great Conan the Barbarian comics that he lost in a flood. So if you know Andrew's uncle and 
have a few of those comics lying around, want to help them out, we'll connect you. That is The National for September 29th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night right here for The National. Have a great Saturday.